Let's welcome him to Valencia Hills, Dr. Gibbs. Well, thank you. Thank you, dear brother. And it is indeed a wonderful privilege to be here. I received a copy of the Bible for the first time in my life when I was 16 years old. And that co coincided with the very time that I also received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I've always been thankful for the Bible. But in the last several years, uh, I've been asking myself a question. And I'd really like you to ask yourself this question, but let me personalize it. To what extent do I really appreciate the fact that I have right here in my hands the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, and in my language, and I can read it. And as I've reflected on that particular question, my mind went back to 16th century England, where a relatively, a relatively young man, very brilliant young man, spoke seven languages, understood the language of the Old Testament Hebrew, understood the language of the New Testament Greek, looked about him, and the common people in England had no access to the Bible. No access. And so he had a burden. He began to translate the Bible into English, our language, primarily our language. There are others of you in this room that speak other languages, but this was English. Now, you'd think everybody was really excited about the fact that he was translating the Bible into English so everybody could read it. No. Not Henry VIII. Neither the hierarchy of the church. You see, they didn't want the people, the common people, reading the Bible because it would reveal their hypocrisy. It would reveal their inconsistencies. And so, consequently, they began to persecute William Tyndale. In fact, so much so that he had to leave England, go to the continent to finish the translation of the Bible. And as he, as he was completing the project, a so-called friend said, William, it's okay, you can come back to England, you'll be safe. It was a setup. When William Tyndale returned to England, he was incarcerated. Eventually, he was strangled and burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English, our language. And his dying words as he, as life was leaving his body, he prayed, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. A man died so we could have the Bible in English. And I can read it from Genesis to Revelation. A man gave his life so we could be here and hold the Bible in our hands. Think about that. Now, God answered that prayer in a marvelous way because eventually in the next five years there were several Bibles that came out in English. And eventually, when King James came to the throne, he authorized the King James Version in 1611, which became the basis, really, of translations all over the world in many different languages. And so I raised the question and ask you to think about it, too. To what extent do I really appreciate the fact that I have available in my hands today the whole Bible and my language? In fact, many of you have it on your, 
your cell phone, you have it in your tablet, you have it in other ways or other forms because of a man's sacrifice. God wants us to know His will, and He has chosen people that literally have given their lives so we can have the Word of God in our language, that we can read it, that we can understand His will. You see, He began to reveal it years ago, centuries ago. He got, God spoke the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, and then He wrote them on tablets of stone. And that was just the beginning of God revealing His will. This was the first time that God literally, really spoke His Word and made it clear and to, to Moses on the tablets of stone, and then enabled Moses to write the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This was the beginning of His revelation in writing to us. And today we have it in our Bibles. But God, see, was just beginning the process. God continued to speak through the Old Testament prophets, men like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. And first they spoke, and then they wrote. And today we have these marvelous books in our Old Testament, including the minor prophets. They're not minor because they're insignificant. We call them minor because they're smaller. Books that were written by men like Hosea and Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and Micah and Nahum and Habakkuk, Zechariah and Zephaniah and Haggai and Malachi. First they spoke and then they wrote. And we have them, have these books in our Old Testament. But you see, God was just laying the foundation for the coming of Jesus Christ who chose twelve men, twelve men called the Apostles. And God Himself, through Jesus Christ, spoke to them, taught them, led them. Eventually, they spoke, and then they wrote, and the essence of the Apostles is the New Testament, which we call the Apostles' teaching. But the amazing thing, the bottom line of all of this, is God inspired these individuals, the authors of Scripture, to record His message in writing. And here we have it as a result of this incredible dynamic process we call the inspiration of Scripture. How did it happen? Well, we don't know exactly how it all happened because it was a mystery, it was a divine process. A divine process that used human instrumentality and talent and abilities through the inspiration of the Spirit of God to give us a book or books that we can trust that gives us the total redemptive story from Genesis to Revelation as that story unfolds, giving us full knowledge of His plan for our life. This morning, I'd like to take you into that process just a little bit because it's amazing to me. And God gives us some insights through Jesus Himself. In John chapter 14, Jesus is about ready to go to the cross, and the apostles were really concerned. They were upset, and He said, look, don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send another counselor. And we read about this here in John chapter 14, and notice we read in verse 16, and I will ask the Father. and He will give you another counselor." Now remember, He's speaking here, actually, to eleven men because Judas is gone. He's going to betray the Lord. And ordinarily, you don't have to understand, thank God, you don't have to understand Greek, the language of the New Testament, understand the message. Sometimes it helps to know some of the words in Greek, and here's one of them. And it will become clear to you as we move along in this message. The word that is translated counselor is parakletas. Parakletas. Say it. Parakletas. Now, in King James, it was translated comforter, another comforter. Remember that? It could be translated another teacher. It could be translated, I think, 
one of my favorite words in English would be another encourager. Here in this translation, another counselor. And who is this counselor? He's to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. And that's very key. The Spirit of what? Truth. And three or four times right here in the upper room, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. And He said, I'm going to send Him to you. Now, a little later, right here in this same passage, you get to verse 26. But the Counselor, the what? The Parakletas, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send Him in My name. He will teach you all things. Now, remember, He's talking to 11 men called the Apostles. He will teach you all things, and He will remind you of everything I have told you. Jesus has been with them for nearly three and a half years. Now, imagine, here are these 11 men reclining in this upper room, and I can imagine there was was one of them that was sitting there. He was a former tax collector. His name was Matthew, formerly Levi, and I can see Matthew pulling on his beard and scratching his head and saying, what is Jesus talking about? What in the world does he have in mind here? This counsel, he'll teach us all things. He'll remind us of everything Jesus has told us. Well, Matthew didn't get really the answer to that question until nearly 25 years later. And he was somewhere in the New Testament world. We don't know where. He may have been just reclining under a sycamore tree, or he may have been lying in his bed at night, or he may have been taking a stroll, or he may have been just ministering to a group of people somewhere in the world. And at one moment, something happened. And I can only imagine what it was because all of a sudden, perhaps in his mind, in his heart, but he heard words, blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He had heard those words 35 years ago. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. He heard those words on the Mount of Beatitudes when Jesus was there teaching these men and others overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And he went on, he picked up his quill, and he rolled out his scroll, and he began to record these Beatitudes, all of them, that he had heard 35 years ago. Not only that, he went on to record the whole Sermon on the Mount as the Holy Spirit brought us to his memory and recorded for us the whole Gospel of Matthew. And we have it in our Bibles today. Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will teach you all things, he will remind you of everything I have told you. It happened, and today we have the record of that in the Gospel of Matthew. Think about that. Well, Jesus wasn't finished with His instructions. He said to these men, let's leave this upper room, and they were going to head towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And they're walking along. And I can imagine they're about ready to descend into the Kidron Valley, which would have led them over to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's dark. It's night. Strange sounds in the air. They're already looking for Jesus Christ, the Roman soldiers, to take Him into captivity. And at some way, place along the way, Jesus stopped with their torches. They came in near 
Jesus, in a quiet voice, said, Men, verse 26, when the counselor comes, the parakletos, the one I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And I can imagine that standing right close to Jesus, very close to Jesus, was the Apostle John, because he was a very special friend of Jesus in his humanness, disciple Jesus loved in a special way. And he heard these words, and I'm sure he pulled on his beard and scratched his head and said, what is Jesus talking about? And he doesn't realize, he does not realize that about 60 years later, somewhere, maybe in Ephesus, where we know he went. Remember, 60 years later, somewhere, all of a sudden, he heard words. He sensed words in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was God. And He rolled out His scroll and He took His quill, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we, I remember, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John went on to record his whole gospel regarding the miracles that Jesus had done. And he culminated that great book by saying, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. That is this book of John. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And in believing, you might have life through His name. Jesus said that night, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will testify about Me. And that's exactly the whole purpose of the Gospel of John, was to testify and demonstrate that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amazing experience, and today we have the Gospel of John, one of the most significant books in the whole New Testament, demonstrating who Jesus Christ really is. Well, Jesus heads on. They go do through the Kidron Valley over to the Garden of Gethsemane, and at one moment they must have stopped, and Jesus, in a whisper almost, said to them in verse 12, chapter 16, I still have many things to tell you, men, but you can't bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, notice how he repeats the Spirit of truth. Why? Because he's going to reveal the truth, which we have in our Bibles today. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, which we have in our New Testament. For he will not speak in his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. And He will also declare to you what is to come, what is to come. And the Apostle John had no clue that one day he would be in a cave on the Isle of Patmos in captivity. I've been in that cave. It's an amazing experience. And there, Jesus Himself appeared to John, said, pick up your quill and begin to record the things that are and the things that are what? To come. And today we have the book of Revelation, the final book of the New Testament. Jesus promised that. He said, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will declare to you what is to come. And that's the whole purpose, primarily, of the book of Revelation. Well, you know the story. He came. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and the church was born. And Peter got up to speak, to begin to explain. And as a result of that, 3,000 came to faith in Jesus Christ, and it says they continued in what? The apostles' teaching. 
Acts 2.42. They continued, you bring that slide up, and they voted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What was the apostles' teaching? Well, first they spoke, and then they wrote. And today we have our New Testament, which in essence is the apostles' teaching. Now I want to fast forward you. I'm going to take you to um, the last book the Apostle Paul ever wrote, last letter. As you know, he was called to be the great apostle to the Gentiles, did missionary journeys, and eventually ended up in prison, got out of prison, went back in prison, this time a dungeon. And this is the last letter that he ever wrote, and he wrote it to Timothy. And we find it, some words that are so significant in verse 14 of chapter 3. 2 Timothy. But as for you, Timothy, and remember now, Paul's in a dungeon. Somehow he's able to get some parchment and perhaps with some light streaming through a crack in the wall, he's writing. He knows he's going to die. He knows he's going to be sentenced to death by Nero. But as you, for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you. And you know that from childhood you have known the sacred Scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And just, just think for a moment what Timothy must have been thinking as he's reading these words. Jesus said, you've known this truth from childhood. You see, when Timothy read these words, his mind would have gone back to the first time he ever saw and heard the Apostle Paul. It was his hometown of Lystra. And it was there that Paul and Barnabas came in the first missionary journey, and Paul was persecuted and actually stoned and taken outside the city and left there for death. They thought he was dead. He probably was. And if you read the book of Acts, there was a little circle of disciples, some who had come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, standing around Paul as he was lying there on the ground, stoned. And standing in that circle had to be an old Jewish lady by the name of Lois. That was Timothy's grandma. And standing right next to her, probably a middle-aged Jewish lady, that was his mother, his mom. Her name was Eunice. We know their names because they're mentioned in the first chapter of this letter. And no doubt standing right there with them was a young man by the name of Timothy. His dad wasn't there. He was probably worshiping in the temple of Zeus just outside the city because we know from the book of Acts he was a pagan. He was not a believer. But he had a Jewish grandmother and a Jewish mother who taught him the Scriptures from childhood. And you can imagine what went through his mind when he, sat, when he read these words. As for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know them from childhood. You've known the sacred Scriptures. What, what sacred Scriptures? The Old Testament. They had no New Testament. But notice, the Old Testament was the foundation of his salvation because it goes on to read, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. When Paul came to Lystra, his mom and his grandma and Timothy himself heard the gospel for the first time that the promises of the Old Testament were fulfilled in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he put his faith in Christ. And then Paul goes on to say, now, Timothy, just remember, all Scripture, verse 16, all Scripture is inspired by God, is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I'm not sure that Paul even understood at that moment that all 13 of his letters are going to be incorporated into the New Testament as the very Word of God which we have in our New Testament. But it prophetically, like Old Testament prophets, like Isaiah and 
Ezekiel. They had no concept of how God was going to utilize what they were writing, that we would have it today in our Bibles, all 66 books of the Bible. But we have it, the Word of God. And again, another man died that we might have life and have the Word, and that was Paul. But the man who really gave his life ultimately was Jesus Christ himself, resurrected from the dead as we sang today, the author and the finisher of our faith. But I want to fast forward you one more time. I want to take you to the book of Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, but it was written later on after Paul went home to heaven. I personally think it was Apollos, but I can't prove that. It doesn't matter because it's the Word of God. And here's what we read, and this is, this I want you to think about because this is why I wanted you to know the Greek word parakletos, which could be translated encourager, which is translated many, many times in the New Testament as encourager or to encourage. Parakleo is the verb to encourage. Parakletos, the noun, the counselor, the Holy Spirit. Because here in these verses, the author of Hebrews used the form of that word which applies to us. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. And how can we do that? Well, we have the Spirit of truth having given us the whole of Scripture. To promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but what? Encouraging each other and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Encourage one another. That is the basic word that Jesus used to refer to the Holy Spirit, the parakletos. And what does that mean? That means that we are the parakletoi. That's the plural of parakletos. The Holy Spirit was called the encourager. And here the Holy Spirit calls us the parakletoi. He was the great encourager, but we are the encouragers of one another. Why? How can we? because of the Spirit of God dwelling within us, having given us the Word of God, which was given to us by the parakletos, making it possible for us to be the parakletoi, encouraging one another with the truth that came to us by the Spirit of truth that Jesus was talking about in that upper room. To what extent? Do we appreciate the fact that we have in our hands the whole Bible in our language so that we can come to know Jesus and we can build up each other with the Word of God through the Spirit of God who dwells within each one of us who has come to know Jesus Christ? Amen? Fifteen years ago, I. Uh, got a telephone call. It was a total surprise. It came from Broadman and Holman in Nashville, and they said, Gene, you know we've just completed a brand new translation of the Bible, and I knew that, and I knew the gentleman that was heading up the editor of this new translation. We taught together at Dallas. They had, he pulled together a hundred scholars to do a brand new translation of the Bible. They called it the Holman Christian Standard Bible. They said, we would like for you to take that translation and do a Principles to Live by Study Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Would you do that? And they said, by the way, we think you can do it in a couple of years with everything you've written. <laughs> well, I was just passing my baton of lead pastor to my successor, and it just seemed to be the right time. I, I prayed about it, and I had no idea that I'd ever do a study Bible. 
The two years, well, seven years later, I finished the project full-time, virtually. I spent seven years from Genesis to Revelation looking for principles to live by. And I have to tell you, that was a whole new experience for me because line by line, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, I went through the Scriptures for seven years. It was virtually my life. Four days a week. My wife says five days a week. I was in the Word, looking for principles to live by. This question went through my mind. To what extent do I really appreciate the fact that I have in my hands the whole Bible and in my language? I've developed a whole new appreciation of the gift God has given us. Father, thank You. Thank You so much for the Word of God. And thank You so much for the privilege of teaching it. I thank You particularly for the opportunity that I've had to prepare this Bible that you've chosen to use literally around the world. Thank you. I'm humbled. We're all humbled, Lord, in view of the fact that you've given us your divine message so we can read it, study it, teach it, and grow and mature in our faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, and all the people said, Amen. Amen.